it appears that the universe is bigger than it is older. How does that make sense? Oh, oh, yeah. So you're talking about the fact that we can actually see stuff in our observable universe that's located at a distance that is farther than the speed of light times the age of the universe. Yeah. Naively, you would say that the, the you know. So you're right. If the universe were static, um, if the universe came into existence, and you can conceive of this, the universe came into a, a big bang in a fixed universe. So the universe just ex started off. Those galaxies were, you know, they could be moving towards us, away from us, who knows. Um, that you could say, I can see a galaxy that's at a distance of only 13.8 billion years times the speed of light. That would be true. But the fact that the light is expanding along with the expansion of the universe. So imagine there was some very distant past. We were near a galaxy. It's going to produce some light. And that galaxy is going to be moving away from us. The light's going to be getting more and more red shifted, as it's called. And it's going to be moving farther and farther away from us uh, uh, as time goes on. There'll be some acceleration as we get into the era of dark energy. Um, the light signals, there'll be some cone of acceptance, if you will, um, from which, which represents all the events that we could have received information from. We can't currently communicate with that galaxy, it, it sent us some light and now it's moving away and it sent us some light. And because the space is also dragging the photons with it, if you like, the photons are being uh, participating in the expansion of the universe. That's why they're redshifting. That we can see things to out to where the universe first began expanding, not just when it began existing. And because the universe has been expanding for 13.8 billion years with no sign of slowing down yet, which is a huge uh, surprise, serendipitous surprise, um, that we can see things approximately three times the age of the universe away from us. So we can see, it's called the age of the universe 15 billion years, just to make the math simple. We see things at 45 billion light years distance in that direction. And we see things at 45 billion light years in that direction, <laughs> just turning our telescopes 180 degrees away. So that means we see things that themselves are, are 90 billion light years away from each other. That's sort of the diameter of the observable universe. Is there another universe beyond that? We don't know. Some conjecture, there's not only one, there's an infinite number of them. How are you emotionally okay with the fact that our universe is expanding? So like... It's gonna be like Annie Hall, like with Alvi uh, Singer. No, just, I, I'll grow up in the Soviet Union. We watched propaganda. <laughs> I, I realized that you did. Yes. Uh, so there's a thing. Annie Hall is Annie that Hall. some kind of uh, <laughs> a, what is the <laughs> uh, propagandist uh, <laughs> movie with Woody Allen? Um, certainly canceled, but yeah. uh, but nevertheless, back when he it was uh, uh, not canceled yet. Uh, he made a movie called Annie Hall, in which as a it's a self depiction. He's like a Larry David before Larry David was Larry David, neurotic, typical neurotic young Jew. He's in Brooklyn, and he all of a sudden tells his mother he's not doing his homework anymore. He refuses to do his homework. His mother says, "Why?" He goes, "Because the universe is expanding, and it keeps on expanding. Uh, everything will rip apart, and no, we'll never have anything in contact, and everything is meaningless." Uh, and I assume these are some of the topics we're going to get to. Uh, and and she goes, "What are you talking about?" We're in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is not expanding. Uh, and that's true. Brooklyn is not expanding. The solar system is not expanding. Oftentimes they get asked, what is the universe expanding into? That's right. one of my favorite questions. Uh, what is it expanding into? And I say, it's actually an easy question if you think about it. Um, you've seen your friend Elon. He goes out in space. He's got a rocket, right? What's outside of the rocket? If you take, if you take this bottle, empty out this bottle, take the cap off it, go outside the rocket, you know, sipping some tang, Screw on the cover of it. What's in there? Is it empty? <laughs> uh, that's just semantics, I guess. Uh, yeah. No, it's definitely not empty. Uh, so you step outside the rocket? Yeah, you're in the vacuum of space, the quote-unquote mm -hmm. vacuum of space. And there's no more liquid in it? There's no more liquid in it. No, it's just a, just a container, one cubic centimeter. Let's just uh -huh. make it simple. One cubic centimeter of a uh, box, and you take it out into space outside uh, the Falcon, whatever, right? Yeah. Um, What's inside that box? It's not empty. There's actually, I'm going to say, uh, this is going to set your friends up. There's 420 photons from the fusion of the light elements that we call the cosmic microwave background inside that box at any second. Okay. All right. right. Hold on a second. What? Four, 420. That's, uh, I've heard of that number before. All right. Let's. It let's... used to be 69. But then they changed. <laughs> wow, physics works in mysterious ways. Okay. In the millimeter box, it's sixty nine. What What are we talking about here? What uh, What's in I'm, What's I'm, What's in the box? I'm gonna get. <laughs> that's right. Let's think outside the box. No, we're thinking inside the box. So, if you have a, a, every cubic centimeter of our observable universe is suffused with heat left over from the Big Bang, 
dark matter particles. There's a little ordinary matter in the universe. Um, uh, and every cubic centimeter, there's some probability to find a proton, a cosmic ray, an electron, et cetera. There's actually an awful lot of neutrinos inside of that cubic centimeter. Now, just imagine how many cubic centimeters there are in the universe. It's enormous. That's why there's enormous numbers of particles in our universe. It's a very rich universe. But now let's zoom in on that box. So now inside that box, there might be, you know, one, let's let's say there might be one ordinary matter, like a proton or an electron, a baryon, a, um, a lepton. There might be a couple, some, um, a couple hundred neutrinos, and there'll be a couple hundred photons, as I said, 420. What's between those guys? What's between the protons and the neutrinos and the photons? Like, just zoom into a, a cubic micron now. Like, imagine 420 things inside a box this big. It's actually pretty empty. Mm -hmm. Like, they're just zipping around in there, right? So between them, there's a lot of empty space. And this is outside the kind of physics-based models of fields and all those kinds of things. Yeah, just like, just actually fields, yeah. asking the question of, like, what is this emptiness? What is the particle content in the universe in every cubic centimeter of the universe? Outside of the 420. So you have the 420. Yeah. 420. They, they, have the, they have some, you know, you know they have some mass. Yep. Yeah. Oh, they have the energy. They don't have matter. Photons don't have matter. Uh, uh, energy. That's why they don't mass. bring suitcases. You know that's true, right? Photons never bring suitcases with you, with them, because they're traveling light. Hmm. See, I don't even get a laugh this out is, of you. That's uh, so corny dad jokes. Okay, you'll you'll appreciate it. Something. No, this God is pretty will. good. It's just <laughs> I'm laughing on the insides. What's in the box? What's the 420? What's between the photons? That's what space is. That's what the universe is expanding into. Okay, that's nothing. So that's. That's the notebook yeah. on which the photons are written. Exactly. This, That's beautiful. But work, still, right? uh, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Uh, still, I, I I understand this, but it's still uncomfortable that that if the uh, the universe is expanding, that this thing is expanding. the The canvas is expanding. It's very strange. Mm. Because like if we were just sitting there, still, I guess if we're in Brooklyn, nothing's expanding. So our cognition, our under intuition about the world is based on this local fact that we don't get to experience um, this kind of expansion. Hmm. Yeah, and that intuition leads us astray. But you know that gravity is the weakest of the so-called four fundamental forces. Um, and yet it has the longest range you know, pervasiveness. Gravity is, you know, we're being pulled towards the Andromeda galaxy at, at some enormous rate of speed because of its massive counter gravitational force to the force we exert on it. Uh, so gravity is enormously a long range, but incredibly weak. And because of that, uh, we can think about these effects of expansion as the relationship between the, as you said, the, no, the, the grid lines on the notebook, right? Gravity is a manifestation of the interrelationship between those points, how far they are from each other. And those can change. Those point distances can change over time because of the force of gravity. So it's weak. And what, but, and what we experience as gravity is the um, changing of those trajectories from being rectilinear to curvilinear. That's what we experience as gravity. Well, you had this analogy when you talked to Barry Barish about a bowling ball and a trampoline. And uh, that's almost right uh, because it's actually, you have to visualize that now in, in four dimensions, like wrapping a trampoline at every point around the object, including on the sides. And you know, it becomes very hard to visualize. So a lot of people use that. Um, it's also a fraught analogy because you're using gravity, like the notion of gravity pulling something down to explain the notion of gravity. So it's a little overburdening the analogy. Mm -hmm. But okay, so you mentioned Barry Barish wrote the forward to your book. Yeah. Uh, how, how do gravitational waves fit into all of this? How, how do they, emo on the emotional level, how do they oh. make you feel that they're just uh, moving space time? <laughs> yeah. So gravitational waves were the Nobel Prize for gravitational waves discovery the first time. You know, it's this, this, it was discovered twice indirectly by two uh, men uh, named Holson Taylor. And that was given my first year of graduate school. The day I entered graduate school almost, they, they announced these two guys won it. And the guy who won it did the work that would later win him the Nobel Prize when he was my age. Is this in the 40s? Uh, this was, no, this is the 19th. That was a joke. Nine, yeah, that was All good. Right. That was good. Thank you. I got it. I got it. You know, All to right. a cosmologist, age means nothing. Yeah. Um, and to a tennis player. Not on Tinder. <laughs> That's right. All right. Um, so, sorry. So gravitational waves do fit in uh, because what we're trying to do now is use the properties of gravitational waves, the analogous properties that they have to photons, that they travel at the speed of light, that they go through everything, they can go through everything, and that they're directly detectable. We're using them to try to 
confirm if or if not inflation occurred. Mm -hmm. So did inflation, the spark that ignited the fusion of the elements in the early part of the universe and the expansion, the initial expansion of the universe, did that take place? There's only one way that cosmologists believe we could ever see that through the imprint of these primordial gravitational waves, not these old you know, newcomers like Gar Barry studies, the ones that occurred a billion light years uh, away from us uh, a billion years ago, uh, but we're seeing things that happened 13.82 billion years ago during the inflationary epoch. However, those we cannot build a LIGO and put it at the Big Bang. So if you want to measure, let's say you have a, a, the old time um, uh, firecracker, let's say there's a firecracker and you want to see if it went off in the building next door to you. You can't see it. So you can't see the imprint of it, but you can hear it. And what we're trying to do is hear the effect of gravitational waves from the Big Bang, not by using a camera or even an interferometer like Barry used and his colleagues, but instead using the CMB the light, the primordial ancient fossils of the universe, the oldest light in the universe, we're going to use that as a film, quote unquote, onto which gravitational waves get exposed. And hope you can, uh, so what are the challenges there to get enough accuracy to, to, for the exposure? So the, the signal, as I said, is, um, so there's 420 of these photons per cubic centimeter, and there's a lot of pho cubic centimeters in the universe. However, what we're looking for is not the brightness of the photon, how intense it is. We're not looking for its color, what wavelength it is. We're looking for what its polarization is. And so, we'll go there. Let me yeah. just ask, are you serious about the per <laughs> cubic millimeter of 420 is the number? Centimeter. But, uh, uh, cu uh, cubic centimeter. Yeah. 420 is the number. That's the number. Uh, I wonder if Elon knows this, and if he doesn't, he will truly enjoy this. Okay. <laughs> this uh, okay. is yeah, it's true.